Hi. The first lesson we're, that we're going to begin with is the tools lesson. Never before have there been so many language learning tools, both in hard copy and online, at your disposal. Finding the right ones can be very daunting or challenging for you guys. So in this lesson, I would like to introduce some of the tools that you're going to need, both when you take this course and write your essay, and show you how to use them correctly. And by correctly, I mean how to improve your vocab and how to eliminate the typical language mistakes that you guys make. So let's begin. First thing I want to take a look at is, what do I write when I write? Well, we have three possibilities, words, chunks, and sentences. Take a look at the first sentence. Bill, a heavy smoker, was not worried about the possibility of getting lung cancer. Obviously, this is a sentence, and you write a sentence in your essay. This sentence consists of words. Bill, a, heavy, smoker, they're all words. But this sentence also consists of chunks. And a chunk is a unit that is generally larger than a word. And it's a syntactic unit. So Bill, a heavy smoker, is a chunk. The possibility of getting lung cancer is another chunk. The students spent two weeks in a town near Barcelona taking a Spanish course. Two weeks, a chunk. In a town near Barcelona, a chunk. Taking a Spanish course, a chunk. When you read sentences out loud, when you write sentences, when you understand sentences, when you memorize things, you don't just memorize individual words, and you don't always memorize whole sentences. Rather, you memorize these kinds of units that are called chunks. So in here, we'll take a little look at how to learn words, or what does it mean to know a word, and how do you learn a word, and how do you learn or exploit chunks in your writing. So let's begin first. What does it mean to know a word? It's actually a very complex state of affairs. So what does it mean to know a word? Well, you need to know the word's meaning or meanings. It right? could be plural, it could be more than one meaning. You need to know the written form of the word, how it's written. You need to know the spoken form, so it's pronunciation, maybe it's stress. You need to know the frequency, right? could be another possibility. How often does it occur in the English language? Is it a very common word? Is it a word that occurs very rarely? How about the type of English? Is it British English? Is it American English? Is it maybe Australian or Irish English? It's grammatical behavior. You need to know register, collocations, and associations. So those last four concepts, let's take a look in a little more detail. So first, the grammatical behavior. For example, if it's a noun, is it a countable noun? an uncountable noun, or both. And this is important because if it's a countable noun, you can use it in the plural. If it's an uncountable noun, you generally wouldn't use it in the plural, or you wouldn't put an S on the end of it. Some nouns have features of both. If it's a verb, can it be used in the progressive or not? If it's an adjective, can it be used before the noun, after the noun, or both positions? So that's some just examples of the grammatical behavior of a word. Register. Register is the style or variety of language used in a particular social setting for a particular audience on a particular occasion. So let's take a look at these three sentences. First sentence, he is not going to do it. Second sentence, my client refuses to comply with your client's request. The third sentence, forget about it, he ain't going to do it. So obviously the first sentence, the register would be a little more of a neutral register, can be used in many different contexts. The second sentence, this type of register would be very appropriate, let's say, to a business meeting or a, a negotiation, or maybe even, a, you know, let's say if you're in a court of law, this would be the appropriate register. And forget about it, he ain't gonna do it. It's like if you're in a New York City bar and you're, you know, you're, you're talking to your buddies, etc. That's appropriate register, whereas my client refuses to comply with your client's request is not appropriate register in a New York City uh, or a bar in Brooklyn. Second thing is, or third thing is, is collocation. Collocation is a combination of words that happens very often and more frequently than would occur by chance. So let's take a look at these two, these two nouns. We have T and computer. Now essentially powerful and strong both express kind of the same sentiment, but we would not say a powerful 
tea. I would like powerful tea, please. No, I would like strong tea. So how would you like your tea? Oh, I would like my tea strong. I would like some strong tea, not weak tea. Whereas with a computer, we don't use the word strong computer, but we use the word powerful computer. And there's no reason why we use strong in connection with tea, and there's no reason why we would use powerful and not strong in connection with computer. These are just things that we do. They're called collocations, and they're things that need to be memorized or they need to be learned. Next thing is association. So we have a, a distinction between the denotation and the connotation. The denotation is the main or the basic meaning of a word, and the connotation is the idea suggested by a word in addition to its main meaning. And so now I don't want to wade into a very controversial topic, but nowadays, I mean, I'm sure you guys listen to rap music, or some of you listen to rap music, and you hear the word thug or thug life. So the denotation of a thug, it's a violent person, especially a criminal. You look it up in the Oxford Advanced Learner's Dictionary. The connotation of thug, when people talk about a thug or thug life or thuggish behavior, unfortunately in America, it's black, right? We're referring to something, it's a bit of a, uh, has a very racist uh, or a racial uh, overtone. It's a racial connotation. So these are these things that when you learn a word or when you know what the meaning or when you know a word, these are the different things that can be involved in knowing what a word is. Now, what does it mean to know a chunk? Well, a chunk, since it's a, a unit that's larger than a word, you need to know the meaning or the meanings of the key components of the chunk and the placement in a string or sequence of chunks and relationship to other chunks. So if we can maybe go back a little bit and let's take a look over here. What do I write when I write? Right, Bill, a heavy smoker, was not worried about the possibility of getting lung cancer. Obviously, this chunk, a heavy smoker, right, being a, an extra information phrase or an extra information noun phrase, needs to go close to the noun that it modifies. So Bill was not worried about the possibility of getting lung cancer, a heavy smoker. That doesn't work, right? This chunk, a heavy smoker, needs to come after Bill or needs to come in some way, shape, or form around where Bill occurs in the sentence. The same thing over here. The student spent two weeks in a town near Barcelona taking a Spanish course. The student spent in a town near Barcelona two weeks taking a Spanish course. Works as well. It's better spent two weeks in a town near Barcelona, but that works as well. However, the student spent taking a Spanish course two weeks in a town near Barcelona. Mm, 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 doesn't really make me very happy, right? The, the best place for this uh, chunk would be sort of at the end of the sentence. So let's continue. Now your monolingual dictionary. This is the first tool and probably the most important tool that you're going to be using. Now a monolingual dictionary, there are four of them that I can recommend. The Longman Dictionary of Contemporary English, the DCE. The Oxford Advanced Learner's Dictionary, the OALD. The Cambridge Advanced Learner's Dictionary. Or the Collins Cobuild Advanced Learner's Dictionary. Now, Pretty much all of these dictionaries are available as apps or they're available as online versions. However, if at your university you're like, a, you, know, you, you know, you you do things the way we do things here in Kassel, you have to buy an actual hard copy of the dictionary to take with you in the exam. You cannot use your smartphone or your tablet computer or your notebook computer in an exam situation. We won't allow that. So you need to buy a hard copy of this dictionary. So let's take a look and see what are all of the things that a monolingual dictionary can tell you? What is all the information contained in a monolingual dictionary? So let's take a look at these six words, right? two nouns, two verbs, and two adjectives. So let's take a look at the first noun, autumn. See if we can make this picture a little bit bigger. So what do we have here? First thing over here, the Oxford 3000 with a little key, right? And these are the 3000 most common words in the English language. We have a noun or the word class. 
We have British English and American English punctuation, uh, uh, pronunciation, not punctuation, pronunciation. This over here is we have the phonetic transcription. However, if you cannot read the IPA, the international, if you cannot read the IPA, what you can do is you can listen to the pronunciation. So you can click on here to hear a British person pronouncing it or somebody with British English pronunciation. And you can click on here to hear somebody with North American English pronunciation. You have here, especially British English, so it tells you what type of English it's generally used in. And in North American English, we generally use the word fall instead of autumn, although we can use the word autumn as well. You have over here an uncountable and a countable noun. So if it's a countable noun, you can use it in the plural with an S. You have a definition. And you have some sample, some sample usages. In the autumn of 2010, in early or in late autumn, right? These are this type of collocations. In early autumn, in late autumn, the autumn term, for example, at a school or college in Britain, autumn colors and leaves. It's been a very mild autumn this year. So we have more like this. Obviously, sometimes this is extra information or helpful information here. Silent letters. That's so obviously the, we don't say autumn, right? We say autumn, right? The N over here is silent. We have the word origin. And we have some extra examples. That's it. So that's exactly what this uh, dictionary will tell you. And we have some other results. So we have over here to autumn, right? It's the name of a poem by Keats. We go back. We have autumn statement. We have an adjective, autumnal. So it gives you a little bit of word formation over here. So this is all of the information that a monolingual dictionary contains. And your hard copy of the monolingual dictionary is pretty much no different from what you would see here online. It contains actually quite a bit of information. Let's take a look at the second noun, criticism. Once again, we have very much the same thing. But over here, take a look. Open to criticism, take criticism, constructive criticism, to crit criticism leveled at, aimed at, criticism of somebody, something. This is these kinds of collocations. You level criticism. Right? You take criticism. Right? It's constructive criticism. It's all these types of combinations that occur in and around the word criticism or the types of combinations that the word criticism enters into. So this dictionary gives you some of these important collocations. So it gives you an antonym, an opposite, praise. Gives you a little bit of literary criticism. Word origin. Some extra examples, we saw this in the same, uh, these extra examples also contain some collocations. Criticism centered on something, right? Criticism leveled, taking criticism, etc. Right? You raise strong criticisms, right? weak criticisms, valid criticisms, right? Deflect criticism, these are all important collocations right, that occur in your monolingual dictionary. So let's say if you're writing an essay and you want to use the word criticism, so you can take, or you want to say something about criticism, you can take a look in your monolingual dictionaries and find out, you know, what are some of these combinations that I can use. Gives you some nearby words. Critical theory, critical thinking, criticize, critique, right? Other self-criticism. These are all important things that you see in and around this word criticism. You can use these to help expand your vocabulary. Now let's take a look over here. Next word. See pretty much the same thing. We have over here verb forms. And they give you things like present simple third person, singular. They give you past simple, past participle, the ing form. So these are these principal parts of the verb that they give you, these verb forms. They also give you verbs plus prepositions, decide between A and B, and a sample sentence to see how it's used. Decide against something, right? Decide with a WH object. Decide that, 
decide to do something, right? Decide plus uh, an infinitive construction. So these are all imp uh, important constructions that this that this dictionary gives you, and it gives you not only the constructions but a sample sentence as to how it's exactly used. It also gives you well, actually, that's not really the correct synonym. I think they're talking about deceive. It's supposed to be the sin. I think they must have incorrectly linked it. So if uh, anybody from the Oxford um, Oxford University Press is watching this video, please uh, change it. That's essentially what it gives you. Yeah, again, this is the same kind of thing. Um, more like this, verbs usually followed by infinitives. So it gives you some more verbs and followed by infinitives. It's pretty much word family, word origin, extra examples, some phrasal verbs, right? What is a phrasal? That was the University of Castle Internet System, sorry. Can I get this here? This is not coming out well, no. Gives you the phrasal verb over here. Go back, I don't know why. It's gotta be the University of Castle Internet System. So you have your phrasal verbs, nearby words, decided, adjective, decidedly, adverb. And so this is all the information that a monolingual dictionary gives you. So there should be very little problems that you have. You know, do I use an infinitive? Do I use a gerund construction? We'll deal with that in a little more detail later. But your monolingual dictionary, you know, gives you the answer. Do I use a WH object? What do I use after it? I mean, your monolingual dictionary tells you all of this information. So in the, in the worksheets that, are, that, are, that, are, that come at the end of this lesson, you can explore your monolingual dictionary and see uh, what is all the information the monolingual dictionary can give you. Now let's take a look over here, the next one. O, oh, like the verb to O. Oh. Obviously we have a difference in pronunciation between British English and American English, or North American English. Not used in the progressive tense, this is important. Uh, not all verbs can be used in the progressive tense. Some verbs can't be used in the progressive tense. And this gives you an idea, ah, oh, can't be used in the progressive tense. So you can't say, I am owing someone something. I owe someone something. Once again, you have your verb forms, very, pretty much the same thing that, you, that we had in, uh, when we took a look at decide, right? The different structures, the different kinds of object structures. Right? Owe something to someone, sample sentences with definitions, some collocations, you owe allegiance, loyalty, obedience. Pretty much the same thing that you have in the, uh, the verb to decide. Let's take a look over here. Next one, whoop. Classic, an adjective. So usually before noun, a classic novel, study, goal, word finder. Once again, it gives you a classic author, classic book, right? Classic drama, fiction, genre. So these are all words that you can that are that are that are um, that are related to classic or have a they form a word family in and around classic or a sort of a meaning family in and around classic. Also classical. A classic example of poor communication, classic symptoms, classic mistake, right? Also important here, which word? Classic versus classical. Right, so these adjectives are frequently used with the following nouns. Classic example, case, right? Classical. This explains over here the difference. Uh, I remember uh, an exam a couple of, uh, I think it was one or two semesters ago, there was a German sentence. Ein klassisches Spiel, right? Monopoly is a klassisches Spiel. So is it classic game or classical game? Quite a few people got that wrong. And your monolingual dictionary will tell you exactly which, uh, which is correct. So there's no reason for you to get something like that wrong. Right? Informal, and a little bit of a slang word, that's classic. Right? Once again, word origin, extra examples. These are all things that your monolingual dictionary can tell you. So in the exercises that follow, um, what I would like you guys to do is then just explore, right, and see, uh, I'll give you a list of uh, problems, a list of things that need to be solved, and you'll see if you can use your monolingual dictionaries 
uh, to solve them, what, what everything your monolingual or what your monolingual dictionary can tell you. Any questions on that? No? Okay, good.